Well, good morning. We are wrapping up this series uh, that uh, we started last week called Can You See It? And uh, really just focusing on uh, how we can learn to begin to see what God sees and look through his eyes. That's a common phrase is like, how can we see the world through God's eyes? And we're starting uh, next week, we'll be starting a new series called Easter Eggs that'll lead right up to Easter. So I just want to remind you of that we will be doing, making a little few changes uh, in our Easter service. So uh, you know, uh, as we get closer to that, pay attention to announcements. I'm sure we'll cover that, but uh, we're probably not all going to fit in here on Easter. So we're going to do two services on Easter. So uh, be sure that you're aware of that. We'll go back to two services on, on Easter. I want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. But we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks uh, from today, we're going to be looking at passages of Scripture uh, where uh, the, the authors and the writers of the, of the Scripture have left Easter eggs that really uh, speak to Jesus and uh, his coming and his, uh, what he had for us. So we're, I'm excited about that series. I want to come back and invite your friends for that as well. But last week, we talked about this passage out of 1 Samuel chapter 16, where uh, uh, Samuel was looking for the next king of Israel, if you remember, and he was looking for uh, who's going to be the next king of Israel, and he went looking. Uh, God sent him on this journey to Jesse's house to find the new king of Israel, uh, kind of looked at uh, all of Jesse's brothers and thought he had found uh, the next king of Israel uh, in, in Eliab, but uh, has not. But I want to read that passage again. It says, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at <clears throat> Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And we talked a little bit about that last week about, you know, this, how does God see me? Uh, what, does he, what does God see when he sees me? What does he see when he looks at my heart? Talked about searching your heart, kind of digging into your own heart, dying to yourself, and, and living. Uh, our life should live and look different uh, when, when God uh, comes into our heart. And so uh, I want to kind of expand on that. I want to I remind you again that this year, my whole purpose this year uh, I, in our church, in, in uh, this church of Salem Grace, I think that we have a lot of people that come. We've got a lot of people. That, my goal is to push every single one of you into a deeper walk with Christ by at the end of this year, you can look back and go, you know what? I'm a little bit closer. I'm a little bit more like Jesus. Not perfect, but I'm a little bit more like Jesus now than I was when I started 2022. And so uh, one of the, so that's my whole, that's what drive, that is driving my entire message series throughout the year is to push us into a deeper walk with Christ to make disciples out of each and every one of you, uh, because that's the goal, right? Jesus, that was the last thing he told us to do was to make disciples and, and, and go and spread the word of the gospel. And so that's what I want to try to do. Uh, have you ever had to listen to something that you really had zero interest in? And some of you are yes, like right now. Yes. Yes. I see that hand all over this place. Uh, yeah. Have you ever done that though? Ever, uh, who's been to the timeshare presentation? Like, you know, you got the free trip to Florida. We've all done it, right? So maybe not just us. We actually bought one. I know. I, I, I feel you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we got sucked into that. He was like, hey, come to Florida. And we were like, yes, a free trip to Florida. We'll go. Anytime Cheryl Hooters, Florida, she's like packing her bags. She has one just packed, ready to go at all times. But no, like, you ever, have you ever sat through something? Like, I remember one time when Cheryl and I, it wasn't long. The kids were really little. It wasn't long after we were married. And we got a call. Uh, do you guys remember, like, the Kirby vacuum people? <laughs> yes. Did, did anybody ever have a Kirby salesman come to your house? Like, I, I, I will never forget, and, and it's, just, it's just brutal. Like, they come, and, like, they, it's high-pressure sales, and they want you to buy this Kirby vacuum. And some of you younger people have no idea what we're talking about. But it was, like, this vacuum that was super expensive, and it had all these cool attachments and would suck up everything on earth. Uh, and, and you had to listen to this presentation, and I just was not interested. I was toned out. I listened to it once, and then I don't, I don't know if we got, I don't even know why we said yes. I think we felt sorry for the guy trying to sell this vacuum. But I remember one time, like I had a, I had made an appointment and the Kirby vacuum guy was coming to our house. And so I left him there with Cheryl. (laughs) She was not happy. Uh, But you just sit through these things and you make, you know, and I know some of you here this morning probably are, 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 are there. Like some of you are like, you know, I sit through church every morning. I really don't, I really am not interested. I don't, I don't really care to hear another Bible story. And so here's the thing. The goal of this year is for me to drive you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. I can't help you with that if you don't want that for yourself. Okay, so 
I'll just let that lay where it is. Uh, I'm not under any kind of illusion or delusion, rather, that, uh, that I have any power whatsoever to move you closer to Christ. That is a decision that happens in your heart, right? Each and every one of you. So if you're here this morning, I don't know why you're here, why who invited you, or why you came, or why you're watching online, uh, but my goal is to provide you with things to think about. And perhaps you'll be challenged when you leave here And maybe you'll make a decision to come to Starting Point or to come to Bible 101. It's not too late uh, to come to that. Uh, And you begin to start to understand a little bit more about what God is saying through us, to us, through his word and through scripture. And so uh, really, you just have to ask yourself if you're interested in making that kind of investment. You know, it's kind of like the Kirby sweeper guy. Like I I had zero interest in buying his sweeper and I wasn't even really listening to what he, it was probably a great sweeper. I think my mother had a Kirby. The thing was like pushing, uh, you know, a small tank around the house. It was just huge. It it wasn't self-propelled. But anyway, (laughs) but that's my goal. And so I just want to preface that this morning as we walk through this. um, And I'll let that, I'll let that lay where it lays. Um, A question for you this morning. Does anybody know who, uh, does anybody raise their hand if you know the first university ever created in, in America was? Does anybody know who that was? The oldest university? Yes, I see that. Okay, she forgot what it was called, but she read about it. Uh, oldest, 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 the oldest university uh, in America is Harvard. Did you realize that? I don't know if any, a little trivia for you this morning. Harvard was founded in September 8th of 1636. Isn't that crazy? Like, that's a long time ago. That is an old university. Harvard in, founded in Cambridge, Massachusetts in September 8th of 1836, and it was just 16 years after the pilgrims landed. Isn't that crazy? That's, that's amazing to think about for me. And on, I was reading a devotion, that's why I came across this this week about Harvard, and I was reading a devotion by Charles Swindoll, and here's what he, he was actually standing, and if you go to the gates of Harvard, the entrance of Harvard, on the brick that is at the gate entrance of Harvard, there, is, uh, there are words, uh, and there is this inscription, and here's what it says. Okay, it says this. Keep in mind, this is Harvard University. After God, this, this is inscribed on the gate's entrance of Harvard University. After God had carried us safe to New England, keep in mind, it's just 16 years after the pilgrims landed, uh, they formed Harvard And it says, after God carried us safe to New England, we had built our houses, provided necessities for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was advanced learning. Now pay attention to this. Pilgrims, they they land, they get out, it's a new world, they build their houses, they build their, uh, they, they form their government, they, they are establishing this new life in America, and they've got, what they're saying here is that after we've done that, we've provided all the necessities for livelihood, we've killed the deer, we've got food, we've got shelter, we've got the basic necessities of life, the very next thing that they thought that was important to do, pay attention to this next word on this inscription, it says, after we had done all that, we longed to look after a advanced learning, and to perpetuate it to prosperity, dreading, that's a great word, dreading to leave an an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers lie in the dust. And I bet you didn't know this, but Harvard was founded primarily in 1636 to educate and train pastors so that the gospel could be shared. Isn't that amazing? Pilgrims, these people that were new to America, thought to build houses and and, and they thought, okay, we need a church, we need, we, need, we need food, we need shelter, we need this. What else do we need? Oh yeah, we need to be able to train pastors so that our, when, our, when our current ministers die, that this won't be lost, that this good news of the gospel will not be lost, and that we can continue to train others to know Jesus Christ. That was their sole mission. That was the one thing that they thought of above everything else. That was what their goal was. Now, what happened? 
what happened to Harvard? Because Harvard is a far cry from that and its liberal teachings and all that comes out of Harvard today and its humble beginnings of educating pastors. They've come a long way, right? Charles Swindoll said this about it, and I, I love this. I thought it was great. In a strange twist of irony, they drifted from seeing the world through God's eyes and began seeing God through the world's eyes. Something happened that subtly they drifted from seeing the world through God's eyes to seeing God through the world's eyes. And it has changed everything. And as I read that, it made me wonder if that hasn't happened to me in my life, in this church. We, we, make, it, we make God fit in our plans and we work him into our schedules when it's convenient. And we, we're on our own mission. And every now and then, we can allow God to have a part of that mission. He's no longer our mission. He's just part of our mission. And we begin to see the world. We begin to see God through our eyes instead of the world through his. And I couldn't help but think of that. Um, you ever see these? You got, are motorcycle riders here? We got some motorcycle riders. Yeah, okay. Got some motorcycle riders. You, you, you have one of those signs in your yard that says, what, start seeing motorcycles, right? You see those all over, right? Have you seen those signs that they're, they start seeing motorcycles because people don't see them and then they get hit? But um, I, just so you know, I rarely see people when I'm out. In, like, uh, people drive past me. I don't see you. So, don't get offended. I once had a lady get offended because I didn't say hi to her at the fair. Um, I don't see you. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I'm in my own world. It's not on purpose. I don't wave at people. People will text me and like, hey, you know, I just passed you. But uh, it, it, I don't remember. It, it, I just don't see people. Anybody remember the movie Sixth Sense? Did you, did you guys watch that? Some of you watched that movie. It's kind of a weird movie. Um, it's a weird movie. If you haven't seen the movie, it's basically about a kid who sees dead people. Okay? That's all he, he does. He he walks around, people think, he, people think he's crazy, but he just walks around saying, I see dead people, okay? It's kind of a, kind of a weird movie. It has a twist at the end. Um, who do you see? <laughs> That's my question. What do we see? You see, I mean, the kid on the movie, I see dead people. Oh, yeah, well, I see annoying people. I do. I see kind people. I see really slow drivers. I almost passed one. I'm always, I'm always, I, I've come, I've learned to come the, the other way to church. I live out here and sometimes I come down to Antai, but I can't because I lose my religion because there's a train on the tracks. And then when I get here, I don't feel like I'm in a good place to preach because I'm angry. Uh, <laughs> so I just come the other way, but now there's a whole different thing. It's, uh, it's like people just putt-putting through town. And if you're a putt-putter, you know who you are. Just look in the rearview mirror. There's a line of traffic behind you. If you look at the rearview mirror, there's a line of traffic. You are a putt putter, okay? I was behind a putt putter, and I'm always a little bit intimidated never to pass. Like, I will pass you. I will straight up pass you, drive Cheryl crazy. Uh, but then, like, I, 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 I have my church face on on Sunday morning, so I don't. Because usually it's coming up Broadway past the high school, and there are putt putters. And, and I'm like, sure, as I pass this person, they're going to turn in here to go to church. <laughs> and then I'm going to go, whoo, Sorry. <laughs> he turned into evergreen. I totally could have passed him. But <laughs> anyway, that's who I see. When I'm, out in, when I'm out doing my thing, when I'm on the road or at work, at school, at who do you see? And I think the way we see people, do we, do we see slow drivers and people as distractions? Do I see Democrats? Do I see Republicans? Do I see liberals and conservatives? Do I see lost people and saved people? Or who do you see? And do you see the same people that Jesus sees? Because I think when he looks at us, he sees his children, every one of them. And I want to begin to see people like Jesus sees people. 
I think the way we see people has an impact on our worldview, and it has an impact on our kingdom view. What keeps us from seeing people the way God sees them? And I think the first question, answer to that is, obviously, we're not God, right? We're not. But I believe he wants to shape us in the kind of people that resembles him a little bit every week, a little bit closer, a little bit more like Jesus, until finally we get to the place where we're, we will never reach perfection on this earth. But every week we are growing and getting a little bit more like Jesus, and we begin to see people like he sees them. And I think I just don't see people. It's not on purpose. It's just our we're just in our own world. We have so much junk going on in our own life that we can't see beyond our own situations and circumstances of our life. There are some themes and elements that are motivated by God and his son Jesus when, we, when he saw the world. And from the beginning, God saw what his creation had become. And I think if we're going to ever begin to hope to see like Jesus sees or, or to see the world like God sees it, is we are going to have to begin to see, uh, I talked to last week about ourselves a little bit, and we are going to have to begin to see, the, and I'm going I'm to hit this one just right out of the gate, we, got, we, we have to begin to see sin for what it is. It is sin. Okay? God hates sin. He hates, he hates it for the, the calamity that it brings in our lives. It's not like he's like, hey, I don't want you to have any fun. He just knows that there are certain things that are, if, if they're in our lives, that he has put guidelines and, and, and guardrails in Scripture for us to follow. And we, he knows that if we step outside of that, we're going to mess ourselves up. So we, begin to, we have to begin to see sin the way Jesus sees us, and, they, and, and God hates it. He knows that we will have to pay the full cost of our eternal eternity. He, he gave his own son because of it. Here's what God said in Genesis about the sin of the world, that, how the world, he made this creation, and then man just started going crazy. And here's what God said in Genesis 6, chapter 5 through 6. He said, the Lord observed every, the, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on earth, and he saw, and man, if there's not wickedness on earth now, I don't know what is. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined, it didn't even what they were doing, it was what they were thinking. Thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So this is a strong statement in Genesis. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them. And he put them on earth, and it broke his heart. You see, God cannot operate in the same realm as sin. He won't tolerate it. He's holy. He's just. The Bible presents God's attitude towards sin as as hostility, disgust, a burden, filth, darkness. God hates sin, and for the simple reason that sin will separate us from him. And so we have to begin to see our sin the way God sees us if we are going to see others the way God sees them. Jesus taught, and we, we talk about this in starting point. We actually just talked about it this past week in starting point. If you haven't come, you can come. It's not too late. Um, Jesus talked about sin a lot. Here's what he said. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin Temptations are inevitable. These are the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, verse 5 through 9. Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. So what is sin? What is it? And that, that's a question we ask in starting point. We had this conversation last week. Basically, here it is. It's, it, it's, it's somebody who knows better but does it anyway. It's a willful transgression against the known law of God. The more appropriate definition, maybe. But Jesus talked about sin a lot. But here's the thing about sin. 
When Jesus talked about sin, and I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or bad. I mean, maybe you do feel guilty. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not me. Here's the thing. When Jesus talked about sin, he always talked about it in relation to restoration, not condemnation. He didn't show up on the scene to point his finger in your face and go, you're a sinner, I can't wait to send you to hell. Jesus looked at you and said, you're a sinner, I'll take that. And I want to restore this broken relationship because of your sin. That I want to restore this broken relationship that you have with the Father by accepting me. And all we got to do is say, thank you. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. But we have to turn from our sin. We have to. And that's a struggle. I get it. I know. But there is the Holy Spirit that will help us fight that fight. But if we hope to see, if you hope to grow anywhere like Jesus, you, I'm telling you this morning, all of us, me included, we have to address the sin and start seeing the sin in our lives the way Jesus sees it. Period. There's no other option. Second thing is this. We have to begin to see who Jesus saw. And when we begin noticing the people that Jesus noticed, we will be, in fact, for others. I know we have that little slogan around our church, and, it's a, and I believe our, our church is. I believe our, I believe our church does a great job with this. We wear the shirt. I want it to be more than a shirt. Are we really for others? Who did Jesus see? He saw children, <laughs> like the ones I held this morning. He saw sinners. He saw tax collectors who were like social pawn scum. He saw unclean people. He saw sick people. He saw possessed crazy people. He saw women. And in the first century, nobody saw women. They were objects. They had no standing in society. He saw racially marginalized people like the Samaritans. He saw people who were nothing like him, but they liked him. That's who Jesus saw. He always noticed the unnoticeable. And and if if you read about Jesus, you will see this over and over. He constantly stopped for them. Let me read you a story. You might know the story of blind Bartimaeus. Some of you have heard it because you're church people. Some of you have no clue who that is. I'm going to read the story. It's about a blind guy. And Jesus had this interaction with the, the blind guy. And Mark recorded it in his book. And it says this in Mark chapter 10. Then they reached to Jericho and Jesus and his disciples left town. A large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. (laughs) And here's the people that were with him. (laughs) They tell this blind beggar, these are great people, be quiet. (laughs) Many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. Jesus consistently saw broken people. He often stopped. He took time. He made time. Nothing was too important that he couldn't stop and make time for people. I've been guilty of that. I mean, you see people and you drive by and you're like, eh, somebody else will help them. See people walking down the road. I, <laughs> you know, Morgan and I were going to town the other day and we are coming from Walmart. And it was a really cold and windy day. And um, like, I, I saw this girl walking with, sacks of groceries. I'm, I can't even remember her name. And um, she was walking up like toward uh, Applebee's. And uh, like I just, I saw her. I caught it. I saw her. <laughs> and, and I was like, man, we were, Morgan and I were in a hurry. And she's like, and I, had, I had to turn around. 
had had, and Morgan's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I'm," and I was like, well, "I'm I'm gonna go see if that girl needs a ride," and I'm not saying that so. I just I didn't want to stop. Humanly, I did. I was like, "I don't have time for that." I I'm, I was I was late. I was running late. Um, I wasn't even sure she would, you know, get in the truck, but I I did. I turned around and I stopped and I. And I'm like, hey, you need a ride? And she's like, yeah, thank you so much. And very pleasant young girl. And I gave her a ride to her apartment. And, you know, I just, I just wonder, do we even see people? Who are we seeing? Are we seeing people? Are we seeing this world through the eyes of, of Jesus? And I'm not even talking about people in need or people walking on the side of the road, just people in general. On Facebook, <laughs> the people that drive you nuts. The people you want to block. Do you see them like Jesus sees them? When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. And Jesus consistently saw everyone in need. He took time. He made time. And I listen, I get it. It's time we, we feel overwhelmed. It, it feels, it, I know it had to feel overwhelming to him. I think sometimes we forget that Jesus was fully human. It had to feel overwhelming. I mean, people can suck the life out of you, can't they? (laughs) When we begin to see the world through God's eyes, we will begin to see who He sees. And when we begin to see who He sees, we will begin to feel what Jesus felt. There have been countless times through Scripture that Jesus retreated to pray and there's a passage of Scripture, and I'll wrap up with this. It's in Luke. It says, Jesus traveled throughout the towns and villages of that area, teaching to the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, and this is the Scripture that grips my heart. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So who do you see this morning? Who are you seeing? And I believe begin when we begin to see the world like God does, we'll be motivated with the same motivation that led Jesus to the cross. And I'm convinced from what I hear and what I see modeled by Jesus, that the only thing that is going to matter in this lifetime is how we've treated other people and how we see those around us. I'm so grateful for that. I'm going to pray for you, and and then in a minute, uh, Savannah's going to come and share with you guys some really quick. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your graciousness to us. Thank you so much for loving us the way you do. I pray that you would help us move each and every one of us, help us to make that investment of the time spent with you and the time spent trying to know you better and and time spent in Bible 101 or starting point or growing in our faith and our walk with Jesus Christ, that you will make us see the world like you see us. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here.